Today, what we have to do is we have to get ready for the, uh, the lab that you have today. And so the lab is actually going to be quite exciting. Um, and so let's just go back to the slides, if you will. The slides are, I'll go back to the, show you the title slides here. It's this slide deck here. Um, the, uh, we left off, I believe, where we were talking about the, um, I think we talked about this over here, proteins made out of, we were talking about proteins, I believe. Um, by the way, the slides or the, 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 um, the lecture from last Friday is already on YouTube, and so you can always check it out if you'd like to revisit some of these concepts. It's, uh, it's all available for you. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it is what it is. I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's, it's a good video. Anyway, but what I wanted to talk about, though, is I wanted to say that um, we are talking about how DNA goes into, you know, is uh, transcribed to get RNA. Yes, sir. Sorry about the question. Oh my gosh, I, I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, sorry, guys, you have a technical difficulty in class. Sorry about that. Um, there's the back of my head. I removed him. Can everyone see that? <laughs> sorry. Um, for those of you um, who are not in class, uh, the slides were not visible on the wall, so I'm sorry. Okay, so anyway, where we are is this. And so we were talking about the uh, RNA, um, or DNA gets RNA, which gets uh, protein. Remember, DNA is transcribed. It's, um, it's rewritten into RNA. And then RNA is then going to be translated into protein. And so remember that transcribe is, is like you're writing the, the, the language of DNA in RNA, and then RNA then is its own language. But then that language changes when you go from RNA to protein, because protein... Um, it's actually made up of, uh, of these, um, these uh, amino acids, and these amino acids are encoded by three different RNA bases. And so that, su that suggests that the, uh, the, the language is now a different language. We're going from ATGC to all this F, L, I, M, V, and so on and so forth. And so we're really, uh, we're really changing uh, the language. And so when you're changing the language, um, like if you're going from English to French, you're translating. So remember, though, that transcription is going from DNA to RNA because you're just kind of rewriting things, but not necessarily changing the language. But then when you go from RNA to protein, you're actually changing the language, so that's, that's translation. Um, but what I wanted to mention, though, is that there's a lot of redundancy. I mean, a, a lot of redundancy um, when you're working with protein. So, for instance, one thing that we were talking about before class ended on Friday uh, was, for instance, I'm looking at uh, leucine which can be written as CTT, uh, CTC, CTA, and CTG. That means that there are four different DNA codons, or, uh, or triplets, if you will, of, of base. Uh, but there are four codons which code for leucine. And um, another thing that's actually quite interesting is uh, serine, which is like just, if you go over to the right, uh, serine is uh, encoded by TCT, TCC, TCA, TCG. It seems that all, the, all the, the triplets where you have TC followed by some base code for serine. But also, though, if you go all the way to the extreme right and look at AGT and AGC, well, they also code for serine. So it's extraordinary. And so this baffled uh, bioinformatics um, uh, professors and researchers uh, back in the 50s and 60s for a long, long time. And they thought there must be something wrong. There must be some, some goof here. But remember, the reason why this is the case is because you need to have many different ways of coding the same amino acid, as we will see in this class, because you have what's called uh, nested DNA, uh, kind of, uh, well, nested, nested, well, nested uh, I guess, nested DNA gene writing here, or nested, nested genes. And nested genes means that you can have like one gene that's written, that, that you, you read from this, this particular start, and you keep on going all the way to the end. But then if you kind of shift or jump one base and start reading that, that, that gene again, the whole, the whole word is different. We'll talk about this later on. Um, but the whole, world, the whole word for that gene is different. But the thing is, though, that these, the proteins can still be created uh, the way that they need to be because you have this redundancy in this, in this table. But for now, though, uh, this table just means that it's, a ta it's just a table that you can use to interpret um, or to figure out which uh, codons from DNA uh, will give you what uh, amino acid from protein. Um, one thing that's quite interesting here, though, is that when you're reading um, proteins, not always, but most of the time, uh, your protein is going to begin with AUG, methionine. Methionine is 
um, amino acid that most proteins appear to have. And so in, um, in some of the research that we will discuss, um, you'll see that uh, most of the proteins were discovered because they began with methionine. You know, they, they, have the same, they have the same syntax, they have, there's something else about them, there's a grammar that we're recognizing, but because it begins with methionine, and there's grammar, and there's this, and there's that, and there's all these other things to be recognized, we'll say to ourselves, well, we don't know what this thing is, but we believe it's a, it's a coding for a protein. You know, we, we think it's a protein. The only way you can really test these things, I mean, there's several, but you have to you can build a model, but you just grow the protein out and you see what that, what that, that gene does when it creates its protein. But there are several telltale signs, though, when, you, when you're looking at um, whether or not a gene or uh, if something is a gene. When I say if a gene, I'm thinking a thing is there that creates protein. That's what I call a gene, something that creates a protein. Um, at the end of the protein, you have these codons U, U, or UAA, UAG, or UGA. And you'll see that in the table, what those mean is uh, they mean stop. It means stop. It means I'm a gene. I've just I've run my course. I'm finished. I've I've completed my my uh, my instruction code, if you will, that creates protein. I'm done. Turn everything off. Now, when you have types of cancers, this codon that stops the gene from from doing its business uh, has been stopped. That means that the there is no there is no end. It just keeps on going. The process you know, re repeats and repeats and repeats. And uh, while that doesn't sound dangerous. Um, imagine being on a train for a second where, where there's no brakes. I mean, okay, fine, we're just in a train, it keeps moving, that's what trains do, they move, right? Well, the only, the only time they're safe is when you can control them, and when you can control when they stop. And with proteins, the only time that they're safe is when you can control uh, when those proteins uh, can stop growing. Anyway, we actually talk about this in some detail in this course. Uh, this is another another table. It's exactly the same information as this square table or this rectangular table, but this is a round one. The idea behind this is that it just takes up less space and perhaps it's more it's more visual. Um, but I guess you can get the idea about how to read this table, where um, you start at the beginning and you work your way out. And so it's a little bit different to look at, but I think that it's okay. Some people uh, prefer this table over this one. You can just go ahead and like you can go back and forth and see. I'm looking at valine, for instance, in the table in the lower left which I'm seeing is GTT. And so if I start G, uh, let's see, how do I get this, GTT. If I, if I start at the middle of the table and I work my way uh, left, GTN, that means valine in this case. N is, is, a, is uh, it could, it's like a wild card. I prefer this table myself. This one I actually got from uh, Wikipedia, but this one people still use because I think it's easier. Um, anyway, so on the, on the topic of translation, by the way, if there's any questions, uh, please let me know. Just go ahead and holler. Um, just um, open your microphone and, and start talking. I don't see my, um, my chat right now. It's buried in all this other stuff. I have to actually close it because otherwise I, I can't uh, see my slides. But if you have a question, let me know. Um, OK, so getting back to translation. So remember the translation. We're going from one language to another. It's like going from English to French. It's like we're going from one language to a completely different language. And this language is going from RNA to protein. Now, if you don't believe that this is one language to another language, um, just remember that RNA is written with four bases, your, a, uh, your A's, U's, G's, and C's, and then your proteins have, I think, about 21, 22, I think, in there. I have to count them again, but there are protein, there are different proteins, but you're going from basically four to over 20 different letters. And so anytime you have a language which has you know, four or something, so then you're going from another, or going from that language to another language that has like, you know, more than four letters in its alphabet, it's a different language. Uh, and so that's kind of like what this is. But what I'm trying to say though, is in this case, uh, the protein is actually created from these, what's called these codons or these triplets. And there are three different, base, different bases that are taken all together at the same time. And so you can, you can see that, for instance, uh, in this antisense strand I'm looking at, um, antisense, um, the, if you look at the RNA, which comes from the antisense strand of DNA, the RNA is, or the, the antisense strand is TAC. And from that, we get our transcribed, our transcribed uh, RNA, which is AUG. And if you go back to, you know, this is methionine. Again, this is a protein that begins with methionine. Uh, let's go back to the uh, table, let's say AUG. And methionine should be A. ATG, and so it's it's your 
um, from or, or T's in DNA become U's in RNA. And so I'm looking right basically to the, just look to the right of where I am now, where you have methionine. And that's methionine is, is A, T, G. And so that's really three bases taken together, or in computer science you'd say that's step three, but three bases taken all together, which gives us methionine. And so you're, when you're creating proteins, you're going through three by three by three by three by three through your, your code. Now, I don't mean to hurry everyone through here. We will actually hit these things in more detail, but I just wanted to give you kind of an overall kind of flavor of what this trans, trans, transcription and translation um, idea was, because this is kind of the whole notion of everything that we do here. Every, it's the whole uh, you know, central dogma of biology. Anyway, um, there are some other videos that you can watch that might be, um, you might find interesting. Uh, which are these uh, translation videos? There's a about there's an, an mRNA translation. This mRNA stands for your messenger RNA, but it's your RNA. And I, as I call RNA here, I'm calling it really mRNA, but it's the same idea. But really, though, this is your um, this is your whole translation process. And so you can click on these and, and read them, or, or and see these videos, which I think are quite good. Next one is protein th uh, synthesis, which is this is a good one here. And we have a um, from DNA to protein. Again, they're, they're really all um, equally, they're about the same types of topics, all of these videos, they're all equally good. Um, yeah, so anyway, I wanted to spend, um, we will come back to these, these topics, don't worry, we're not going to be, this isn't the end of, of these topics, don't worry about that. I wanted to talk about the um, uh, kind of the, the, the code writing part of this class. We're going to be spending some time uh, writing code in here. And so I wanted to make sure that everyone's software actually does work. And this is especially important for today. Um, today we're going to be using um, in our lab, which is at uh, 2.50, please don't forget there's a lab today, which is online. Uh, we're going to be using uh, Docker uh, to write up some, some Python uh, code. In fact, actually you have two deliverables um, for your, 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 um, your lab, which is really to write two pieces of, uh, of, of Python code. Um, to, to do some manipulations with DNA. It's, it's not difficult to do, I don't think, um, but the coding might be a challenge. And so I wanted to spend some time just to go through some basic notions of Python so that you, ha so that you have that, so that you know how to do that. Now, uh, before I do, um, I asked you on Friday to verify that, you're, you're able to, that your, your Docker was installed on your computer and that it was able to be used. And so I'm going to assume that it has been installed, that everything is okay, and I want to spend some time uh, to show you um, what my, um, well, how do you, how do you use Docker and, and how, to make it, how to make it do some, 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 some cool stuff that we use in this class. <laughs> I know that sounds, it could, that could mean anything. But still, um, still it's, I wanted to make sure that everyone knows kind of like how to use Docker. We will be using Docker all year throughout this course, and so don't worry, it's not going to be, um, this is not the only time that you have to, to pick this stuff up. But anyway, let me just go to, um, let, me, let me just take you then to the, um, the actual, my, 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 my prompt here. And I'll show you uh, what you have in your class docs. And so if you go to your, your lessons, hopefully you can all see this, yep. <coughs> Excuse me, if you go to your lessons and you go to the four, um, the fourth, uh, I guess, slide deck that we have, you'll find that there's something there called Sandbox. And if you go into Sandbox, you'll find that there are these files in here. So what exactly are these? Well, um, I have taught this course several times and other courses where we've used Docker, and I find that when you're asking people to type in commands with Docker, it's actually quite complicated. There's a bunch of things going on. And so I've made these, um, they're called scripts or batch files, if you will. Uh, for Linux, for Mac, and for Windows, um, which, if you run these things, will build a container. Well, let's just stop for a second and talk about what Docker is supposed to do. So, in this class, we're going to be using Python. And because there's a bunch of things that have to be installed sometimes when we run Python, like we may have libraries, we may have other stuff that you might need, um, it's easier, uh, from a teaching perspective, just to give you what I call a Docker file, which is this thing over here. And when you run this Docker file, it creates an environment inside your computer in which your uh, Python is able to run. And if you have any packages that have to that, that package or any, any libraries that have to be installed along with, with uh, Python, then they're all installed right here. And so the idea is that if I give you a piece of code, then the code that was running on my machine will run exactly the same way on your machine. 
because it believes that it's running on my machine still, because the environment is exactly the same. So it doesn't matter whether you're using Windows or you're using, or you use uh, Linux or if you're using uh, Mac. It makes no difference whatsoever because you're running your code inside this environment. It's like a, it's like, it's like a, it's like a room, if you will, which is in your house, which looks like a room, which is in my house. It's exactly the same. <coughs> but the thing is though, that this Docker file, though, if, you don't really see this right here, but this Docker file right here, for instance, all of this stuff right here. This um, I'm just showing you this to kind of give you an idea about what's going on. Um, this file, right, or this uh, this install git h top vim python3 python3 pip, this is really installing uh, the software that you'll need if you're running this variety of, of uh, or that you're running if you're running this uh, this code that I'm giving to you. And so this is just like it's just creating the environment. And so every time you you get a a piece of software for me that, that, that runs in something unusual, I'll give you the Docker file. You run the Docker file, you have all the libraries installed, everything's run, everything should just fall into place and it, it should just run without any trouble at all. And I know that it's going to run because it ran on my machine when I used the same Docker container. So it's very cool. So anyway, I, 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 can't, <laughs> I, I think that the Docker is really, really uh, terrific in this case. If you're in software development, for instance, and you're sending out software to your clients, um, the last thing you want is for them to get the software and say, uh, so this is a Java program or something? Um, how am I supposed to run this? Is there a package that I'm supposed to download with this? That doesn't happen anymore. You give them the Docker file, your client, if you're in development, is, is just able to run the software because they've built the, uh, the environment and then they go inside this environment and then everything just runs as it should. So we're going to use the same kind of thing. And by the way, you can put this on your resume I sure hope that you do put this on your resume as, as Docker um, you know, profici uh, proficiency, uh, because I was watching online and there's like this, this this infomercial for somebody who's in Caltech selling uh, um, uh, online lessons for how to use Git, which we use in this class, and using Docker, which we use in this class, and how to organize your files, which we use in this class, <laughs> in terms of like you know uh, in, in using Docker and and Git. So you're saving all kinds of cash, I guess, by not having to buy this guy's software and, and, and package uh, online learning. Anyway, I'm gonna show you what I do here. So on my machine here, let me just show you what I've got. These files are really all congruent, they're all the same. Before you can run your, your, your environment though, you do need to have, you need to, you need to build your environment. You need to build your container. And so this is what my command here looks like. It's just a bunch of uh, script, but basically what it does is you can run this by typing in sh if you're using a Linux machine. Um, I'm gonna build this and hopefully you can all see this. You may, on a Linux machine or a Mac machine, you may have to type in your password. Don't worry, it's not a security thing. It just means that, that Docker needs to be able to write. Um, it needs to, you're, when you run Docker files, you are root inside this, in, inside this environment. And so you may need to type in a password so that you can build an environment where you can run as root inside your, your container. That's why that is. And then when you leave these containers, <coughs> it asks you for your password again so that any files you create um, are actually assigned to your user, otherwise they are root files. Um, anyway. Now anyway, so when I, when, I, when I type in this command here, sh build macOS, I'm using a Mac computer by the way, so that's why this is Mac. But if I were running a, um, a Linux machine, I would type in build Linux, like that. The files are exactly the same. There's just a few subtle differences between, um, between the uh, Mac and Linux, but it's really essentially the same thing. Um, I can show you what that looks like, but it's, it's really where you're typing in, oops, where you're, you're typing in. I think that in Linux, you have to use this word sudo, whereas in Mac, you don't use sudo to get to the power user or the super user, whoops. Uh, what's going on here? Okay, so uh, so you don't you don't worry about using that, but otherwise the the file is exactly the same. So you have to first of all you have to build your directory, build, and that means that you're or building your your container. Now once you have built it, uh, once you've typed in this command, um, a bunch of things are going to happen on your screen. You'll see all this stuff rolling across, and hopefully there's been no errors so far. But really what that's doing is it's downloading all the software that it needs to have from. Uh, a giant repository from Docker, where it's building the 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 you know the, the room in which you're going to be typing in your Python code. 
I'm assuming that everyone's kind of, that, that it's working for everybody. If it doesn't work for everybody, or if, it, if you're having some trouble with Docker, um, let me know, or actually better yet, ask your, um, your technical leaders today in lab, because they have installed Docker on, on many, many different machines, and so they probably have an idea about how to do it very quickly. Anyway, but let me know, though, if you're having any trouble. Um, the next thing you want to do is you want to run your, run your environment. Now, again, since I'm using a Mac, I'm using the, the run macro. I may, have to ask, I, may have to be, I may have to enter my password here, but because I've entered my password within the last 10 minutes at this, at, this, uh, this, at this prompt, I don't need to do that again. But this is what my environment looks like. It looks exactly the same. You're not going to see anything different if you're using a Linux machine or, a, um, um, or, or your Mac. However, if you're using Windows, um, if you're using Windows, you will see that this is now your environment. And so it's, you're now, even if you're running Windows, you are now running Linux, if that makes any sense. So it's actually quite cool. You're running Linux on Windows. Your software thinks it's running on Linux. So I wanted just to take you through kind of a, a, some, some, uh, some, some, just to show you how this thing works or how you can use this. Um, you're running now inside this, you're, we're inside the container. And you can still reach these files by going with your editor on your regular desktop to the directory and you can still find the files which are inside the source and you can still work with them and you can save them using Atom. But uh, what you want to do is you want to, you, want to, you want to actually run them inside this container. You can edit them anywhere, but you want to run them inside this container uh, because that's where, the, um, that's where the is going to be. Now, let me just say something else. If you don't have Docker working um, and you're running a Linux machine or a, um, or a, uh, a Mac machine, then it, it should not make any difference. You can, you can still get away without having to run, um, without having to run your, your, um, uh, your Docker container. Um, but if you're unable to get Docker working on a Windows machine, then you're, you're going to have to install um, uh, Python uh, man <coughs> manually. And if you have, any, if you have trouble with it with manually, um, please see uh, your technical leaders in, in lab today and ask them to help you get that, to, get that to work. Anyway, but we're inside here. These are the files that we've got. And this is a basic um, Hello World program that I wrote. So I'm sick and tired of looking at just Hello World. And so I wrote something down that looks a little bit more interesting where it's just, it's color, <laughs> Hello World. <laughs> I think it's actually kind of cool. But it's like you can, you can actually get some, some color in, in Python. Now, how cool is that? When was the last time you saw color actually being put into any Python scripts? Anyway, but still, you have this now. And so what I'm trying to say, though, is that if you're able to see this, if you're able to run this stuff, that means that your Docker container, or your Docker container correctly, you have Python there, and um, everything is good to go. Are there any questions at all over this before I move on to the next thing? I'm going to assume everything's okay. One more thing I've done, though, is that I added this piece of code to this hello world just to kind of give you this idea that this is actually testing to see what environment you're running your code on. And so um, this code is running in a Linux or OS X environment. Uh, that's your, man your um, actually, that's your Mac environment, I guess. But what this is doing, though, is you're, it's saying, for instance, that um, it's actually, there's a piece of code in here. In fact, I use Vim for this just because it's uh, easier. But if I type in OS, I have in here some place that, uh, uh, that talks about, that actually does a search for what kind of, what kind of environment are we using, what kind of, what kind of operating system are we using. In fact, right here, get platform type. This is actually checking to see what kind of platform do we have. And so every time you run this, this piece of code here, this will tell you, I'm looking out at the operating system, and I see Linux or a Mac-based environment. Here, I don't, differ I, I don't differentiate between Mac and Linux, um, but it, does, it, it would tell you, though, that it would be running a Windows environment if you were not in your Docker container. You can try that if you want, but it should work. Um, I hope it works. <laughs> I think it does work. I should tell you, though, that I, I, I really don't have a Windows machine. I don't know anything about Windows uh, PowerShell. And so if you have trouble with your PowerShell, please see your technical leaders. I'm more of a, um, a Mac and Linux person. Not that there's, any, there's nothing wrong with Windows. I just, I just never very much. I just, I just use Linux. Free at the time, and so I, <laughs> so I began using Linux when it was free. Anyway, so there's that. Um, 
I wanted to go back now to the slides and just kind of give you an overall or an overview about, about what, we're, what we're doing with, with Python. By the way, the script files uh, are here so that you can see kind of like what you're supposed to do. I do hope these files work. Um, the reason why these are there is because, um, remember, if you go out to Docker and you read their, their um, kind of their uh, online help about how to establish a container and how to uh, then, um, I guess, uh, uh, mount a, a hard drive so that your container can, can work with local files and, and all of those things, that's just extra work that has to be done. And, it's, and sometimes it's difficult to, to read uh, or it's difficult to find all these, uh, these commands that have to be put together to make this thing happen. And I, said, and, I, and I found that when I, when I was going out to Docker, it was actually kind of a headache to try and figure out how do I write a command that makes this all happen. And so that's why I'm giving you these bash files. And so you can always use these bash files for other projects. I mean, they work for this, but this, they, this sets up Linux or Python on Linux, but there's nothing to say that you couldn't use them to set up you know, Java on a Linux environment or something else. Anyway, uh, let me know how you do use them, though. I'd be curious to find out. Um, the next thing we're going to be talking about is uh, Python. We're going to talk about like how Python can be used, and it's uh, actually quite a cool language. Um, just say, um, I, I really can't look at people's hands here, but um, maybe go to the chat and put a star there um, if you have no experience um, with, um, if you have little to no experience with the um, uh, uh, with, with Python. Little, exper little experience? Is your language zero? Zero. I'm a <laughs> okay, okay. Well, that's fine. Um, we're going to we'll, we'll spend some time doing all of these things. I think you'll find that it's it's um it's not as bad as you think. We've had there's one person here who has who has who has no um well no experience with Python, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be difficult. We step by step. Every time we go through some piece of software, I will spend some time actually talking to you so you have an idea about um, like what it's what it's doing. How is it supposed to work? Um. Okay, let me just see something here. Um, okay, hopefully I can stop my. Okay, so now let's go back to the code itself. Then, um, actually, where's the? Uh, I'm trying to find my slides here. Goodness gracious! I know that for here you just see my screen up there, and it looks like it's the slides are right there. But for me, though, I have all these windows moving around. Now, Python is a programming scripting language. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, had much experience with it. Um, it's actually a, it's a, it's a, I would say a very simplistic language to learn. Um, it's not, uh, there's not what I call a bunch of overhead when you're learning how to program a, a language. Or it's not like running Java, for instance, where you have so many things that you have to do before you can actually start programming. Um, I think that, that Python's actually quite user friendly. Yeah, I, I say that, but maybe it's, maybe that, that maybe that's not the same thing. I have to take my word for it. Yes, you have to take my word for it. Um, but so we're, there's a, there are some online, you can use Python online if you like, if you're having some trouble getting your Docker container to work. And I found this link here, which is actually kind of cool. I don't know much about, about this website here, but I do know that you can write Python code uh, in a browser, which is actually quite cool. So for instance, Python is, is just this. This command, you can see, you're just basically making a simple print statement. And inside here, you have what's called a string, which is like a link, it's like a, a bunch of characters strung together. That's why they call them strings. Kind of a poetic term, I think. But you can do all kinds of cool stuff in this little thing. You can write little simple programs, and I think you can, how do I actually edit some? I can just go ahead and edit things and start adding, um, welcome to bioinfo. And, if I, and then if I hit run, you can see that it does some more stuff. And so it actually does, it, it's, it's Python, it's online. So I'm bringing this up to your attention because if you have trouble getting Python to run locally on your machine, um, or you, you're having some trouble getting um, Docker to run your machine, then in a jam, you can always just go onto this website here and then just type in some of these codes or some of the, some of the source code and, and, and run Python. But I will say though that you may need to have a you may need to sign up to hold on to your code, or what you can do is you can just copy everything. I don't know if you can see me copying everything here. Maybe you can't. But I'm just copying everything, and then I'm going to put everything into a, a text file of my own, and so I can, I can hold on to this. So what I'm saying is, don't lose your text. Don't lose your your code, because this is a uh, um, it might take you some time to put this together, and then if you if you leave this website, you might lose your stuff. And so what I would recommend is that you use a, an editor. And you type everything in, and then you paste it in here and, and run it. If that doesn't, if you if you're having some trouble with with your, uh, um, well, if you're having trouble using Docker, otherwise I wouldn't use this for a serious uh, Python coding. 
Um, so there we are. So if you have to install, if you want to install Python on your machine, your own machine, if you're, I mean, if you're, if you're a diehard coder, like, like I guess I would, I would call myself a diehard coder, um, then you might want to install Python on your machine. If you wanted to do that, you could go out to this website here, which is just python.org. It is a an open source project, which means that really it's not going to be trying to. Uh, they're not trying to sell you anything. They're just, they have t-shirts and cups and things like that to sell you. But this is an open source project, which means it's a free programming language that they're, that they're just offering you. And so you can just download this software like right here, right above where I am there. You can just download this and you can run it. Now, if you're running a Windows machine or a Linux machine or a Mac, you kind of have to know what kind of machine you're running before you can download this. But once you do know, then you can just install this. One thing I will say though, that if you're a Windows user um, in the past, um, you want to make sure that there's there's an option in the installation that allows you to install Python using the um, in, in the path. Something about environmental variables, including Python in the environmental variable. Um, that just means that you can run Python from wherever you are on the hard drive. So you, you want to look out for that particular option as you're clicking through your installation on, on Windows. But again, if you have any trouble with the installation of any of these things here, bring your questions to lab and we can talk to our technical leaders. We have three very fine people um, who are to, to help. Uh, we have Christian, Kylie, and Danny. And so I think that they will be, I mean, if, if <laughs> they will be able to figure out the problem. I'm, I'm fairly sure. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now to the slides if I can. Um, here we are, here's the download here. Now, let me just give you an idea about how to use Python. Now, I'm gonna be switching back and forth, and so I don't mean to make you feel kind of queasy if I'm going from slide to, you know, slide to slide here. But really, we have in our slides um, uh, calculating values. And so if I go to my prompt, remember, I'm still, I'm still working inside my, my, my container. If I type in who am I as a command, who am I, it should say that I'm a root, and that means that that I'm, a, I'm inside my container. It's, but also, though, you'll just notice that your container just looks, the prompt just looks funny. That means I'm inside my thing. Anyway, so I'm gonna just show you how to, how to get into Python. So if I'm inside Python, or if I'm inside, if I'm inside my container, I just type in Python 3, press enter, and you'll notice that my version is 3.8.5, and I'm thinking that your version should be the same version. It, I'm pretty sure that's gonna be the same version. If it isn't, um, I'd, in fact, I'd be surprised if it's not the same version, but it should be the same. Anyway, it should be still, it should be still Python three. And so, type in Python three, and you should be able to get into this. For this class, whether we're using Python three point eight or Python three point six something, um, it should all work the same. In trouble. So let's just go ahead and just type a simple program just to say hello. Remember, print. Then you have inside your print statement. This is really what your function looks like to print something. You have something in quotes. Hello. So really you're saying inside my quotes, I want you to bring this, I want you to, really what this is doing inside computer science or the computer science of the, of the project is, is saying, okay, find the function print, which will take this string hello and then uh, save it into, or save it into the memory and then link all that memory to the video and then link all that video output screen here and then run it. It's basically what it's doing. So it's, it's doing a whole bunch of things here in, in the chips. But for us though, this is just one line and we can even use this to like type in hello uh, world or whatever you want and, it's, and it, it all works the same. Um, another thing we can do though, and going back to my slides and just looking at these slides here, you can use Python as a calculator. So I can say, what is, um, I don't know, what is one divided by two? And I'll see that it's 0.5. Notice I'm just typing this stuff in directly. What is uh, three over four? that's uh, 0.75. So th three quarters out of a dollar is 75 cents. So that's really what it is. You're just, you're just able to like type in these things directly. What is uh, three times eight plus one? 25. Notice also that, I mean, think back to the t when you were in, uh, in, in school and you were doing um, like uh, mathematics here, there's an order of operations here where you do multiplication and then you do your, your additions. So for instance, if I wanted to like, you know, if I were to add a whole bunch of numbers here, order um, three times eight plus one, um, I don't know, plus three divided by four, who knows? All of these things here. Um, 
we don't have to know the, the orders of operation, but this Python actually does know the, the orders of operation. So it is your calculator. It does, it does everything for you. Now, another thing you can do that's actually quite interesting is that it's, notice how we have decimal points. Now, this in itself, I know that if you're not a computer science person, it's, this isn't really much of a deal. But if you're a computer science person, this is actually a really big deal because this is a float. Let me just show you something here. To be a variable, I'll say that s, or I'll actually I'll call it my number, is equal to. And so this is if I type in type my num, this says, what kind of data is this? This is a float. It's a decimal point number. I don't know why they call it floating. I think that's such a silly name, but it's a it's a decimal point. And so in Java, you'd have to actually establish, okay, Java, I'm going to give you a number. And don't be upset, but it's a float. And so then I'm going to start working things through. So okay, it's coming, it's coming. And then push enter, and it runs. And then you have this float that's in Java's memory. In Python, you just say, I'm giving you a number. You figure out what it is. I'm done with you. It's, 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 it's that. It's just as, as simple as that. If I, wanted to, if I went ahead and, and had another one here, I'll call this um, my um, other num. And I'll just say it's equal to, I'll just say it's equal to 10. If I do a type, for instance, oops, T Y P E. Type, by the way, tells what kind of data type is this? I made a mistake there. Whatever. Um, this is of type int, and so ints tend to have like you know they're like counting numbers. I have four apples. I have ten magazines. I have uh, four books. It's like or three books. I have there's uh, twelve chairs. It's, it's 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 a number like you can count to. But a float, as we saw before, uh, is is different because it's like a number that has like you know it's 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 something that you can't necessarily it's not a counting number, it's a number with decimal points. Anyway, but that's actually quite interesting though because in Python uh, you, you don't have to establish that there's an, the, the other type there. But what you can do though is I can do I can I can superimpose these. Um, is the following? I can I can put these thing, these numbers into my my print statement, and I don't have to worry about um, you know, it's, it's I don't have to worry about any other code. So I'll put here my number is my num, and so remember my num is actually the the variable in memory or the bookmark that's holding this this number in memory, and so now what I'm doing is I'm I'm saying print I'm using the print statement. I have a string here which is the stuff that uh, the user is going to see, and then I have this comma. And then I have my num, and what that does is it says, "Go to the memory Python and tell me what you, what number you have in my num, and then report that to the screen." And that's all you have to do. And so in in Java, there's a bunch of extra stuff that's going on that you have to you have to establish the integer, or you have to establish the float, and then you have to do some other things. But here it's just one line. Um, I know that this might seem like I'm just kind of you know uh, <laughs> I'm, by making people um, I might be confusing people. But I, I, I hope that uh, after a while, this begins to kind of click. So here we are. I'm going to, I'm going to establish a number in memory called x. So I'll call it 2, which I'll give the value of 2 to. And then I have the, the value of y, which I'll assign the value of 3 to. I can go ahead and say, well, what is x plus y? And then Python is smart enough to know that, for instance, x is 2, y is 3. And it just says, oh, you're saying, what's 2 plus 3? Well, it's five. And so it's like you're able to, to do that kind of work without having to do any specific, um, uh, you, know, you don't have to establish the, 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 you know, the, the uh, types, which is actually quite nice. So this is some really some slides that kind of talk about that. Um, some strings, we kind of talked about the strings just a second ago, but I'll go back to this just for a moment here. Um, the strings are really not as bad as, as you'd think though. I can say from, I can actually superimpose into my, into my uh, my print statement, I'll say my string, which is another variable. Uh, this is my oops v a r. This is my variable in a as a string, as a string. Ah, where's my hand? Yes, I feel like my hand start is not <laughs> doing very well. So anyway, this is my string. So what I'm trying to say is. Now is not a number, but actually this is a bookmark in memory that actually is pointing to this piece of data. So I can go ahead and say print my string. And so what it's saying now is saying uh, go to memory, print statement, go to the memory and find out what's what is what does my string mean. 
uh, in terms of a, of a variable. And so then it will find it, and then it just prints up the stuff that we, that we saved here. We can add things together. I can say, um, remember we have um, uh, x equals, we have x in memory already still, and so I can, just, I can just add some stuff. There we go. Anyway, but what I'm trying to say though is that you, you have this, uh, you, can, you can just kind of superimpose things into your print statements. We will spend more time in a moment here. Let me just uh, get through some other things that I want to talk about. The reason why I'm talking about these things is because there's a piece of code that I want to go through uh, at the end of today that uh, actually kind of brings all this stuff together and then you should be good to go. Um, here we are. This is some other just regular math stuff that you can do. Again, I can like add 3 plus 4, 3 minus 4, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you even have the modulus function, which is actually quite interesting. So that the modulus function is, is like the remainder. So if I divide 3 by 4, um, how many times does 3 go into 4, and what's the remainder? And so the modulus is just saying, what's the remainder of, of 3 dividing into 4? Next, we have powers. So for instance, if I have um, 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, well, that's the same thing as 3 raised to the power of, of 4. But in Python, though, I don't have to type in a code that has this caret. And that's what they call this character here, a caret. I don't have to type in a caret. I can just type in uh, pow3, which is my variable. Or not my variable, my, um, or it could be a variable, but it's my number. And the power is the second thing after this comma. So you're raising a number to the power of 4. Let me just show you what that looks like quickly before we go on to the next thing. Um, but if I say 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, push enter here, I can type in pow 3, 4, and I get the same number. Let's say, uh, let's say it's like 5 to the power of 2, I get 25. Or that's going to be 5 times 5. Oops. So you, you kind of get the idea. You're able to raise numbers uh, to powers, and it's actually much more. It's, it's very convenient to use the pow than and to actually kind of you know, line up all these numbers and just kind of chug them out this way. Um, here's some string work. Uh, this will be handy for today. All of these things, by the way, are going to be handy for today. Oh, not all of them, but this will be handy for today's lab, which is why I'm, I'm bringing these things out specifically. Um, this is, let me just go through this quickly. Um, come with me, if you will, back to our over here. <laughs> so I'm going to say my string is equal to Hello, this, oops, uh, the, uh, this is fun. Now, what I'm doing now is I can actually iterate, if I want, between all of these things, all these. This string here is, is um, it contains a whole bunch of, of characters, which are all kind of linked together. Each character on a specific, at a specific placeholder of the string. So if I type in my str and I type in zero, that will give me the H, one will give me the A E, two. You see how this is going here? I can kind of go through, and I can see this H E L L O. Each of these characters here is actually represented by a number. It's an address. Every single string, everything in computer science, everything has a string in, or has an address. And so this is a this is an address. So at the fifth position, I get a space. But let me just say something else that's kind of interesting here. Um, how is it that at the zero if position I have an H? Well, this is really what I wanted to mention today is that um, in Python, you start counting from zero, not from one. There's the old joke about the Python programmer who, um, what was it, he, he goes to the airport with his, with his, his friends or his wife, and uh, he starts freaking out at the, at the, lug at the luggage check. Or the, or the bag pickup, I guess. And there's like, hey, what's, what's the thing, man? What's going on? He's like, ah, oh, I've lost my suitcases. I've lost my suitcases. And they're like, well, how many suitcases do you have? I had zero. And they're like, what are you talking about? It's because you start counting at zero. So that means your, your, your first thing is at, is at zero. Anyway, whatever. If you think about it for a while, it'll, make, it'll be funny. But it's like your, 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 your zero if position is where you start. And so like at zero, that's where you have your H, or your zeroth um, suitcase would be your first suitcase. 
Okay, so you can do all because each of these things has a, has its own kind of uh, uh, because each of these things has its own placeholder. You can do some interesting things. For instance, I can type in give me all the stuff that happens uh, from give me the, all the from the very beginning or from zero to the fifth part of my my string here. Show me all those words, or I can go up to the what's, what happens up to the eighth or the ninth. You can see that as I'm going, I'm kind of able to kind of get more more space, or more I get more more distance in my my string. I get more I can see more of the string when I do this. But I can even go, for instance, if I if I, I can see like what's the tenth to the fifteenth characters mm -hmm. is F. Don't forget this is this is saying that um, that's this chunk of of text right here. Now. This is actually quite important because this, the reason why uh, Python is actually a very good language for for, um, for bioinformatics is because in bioinformatics you spend a lot of time working with text, and so you're able now just to go ahead and, and manip or manipulate text very simply without having to worry about anything. So, for instance, if my my DNA is equal to, I'll uh, just put some some text in here, um, A T G T something like that. Um, I can run my thing here. I can actually say, okay, well, oops. Print my DNA. I can do that, but I want to see like print my DNA. Give me the um, the first, the first base to the fifth base. I can just see that. Now I want you to give me the sixth base all the way to the end. And so I can I can get I can do that kind of manipulation. Now this is actually quite quite complicated with other languages. But this is really kind of saying, cut up the DNA into two different chunks here, and then work with half the chunk over here, and work with the other half of the chunk over here. I can even do some other stuff if I wanted to, where, for instance, I could just say, well, give me, um, I'll just cut this up and save it as a new string. So this is that string right over here. I'll just call this uh, second string is over this, is this. And so I can, if I type in a print, I can see that it's this second side of things over here. And so what I'm saying is that you can work with the text very, very simply, which is actually exactly what you want when you're working with, uh, when you're working with in bioinformatics. Um, oh yes, one more thing here, if I go back to the slides, I'm not, I'm not, I won't type this in, but um, you'll notice though that here's the string A, B, C, zero is A, one is B, two is C, but 200, what is it? 200, we get an error message because it's saying, wait a minute, that string s underscore str, that string that you're using by that variable, doesn't have 200 places to store things. And so therefore, I don't have anything in memory at 200. And so therefore, it's going to give me this error. And so that's, that's something that's... Um, this is a for loop uh, that you can use to iterate through some of your, your sequences, uh, which is actually quite exciting here. I'll just show you what that looks like if we can go back to our, our, our slides here. So let's say my DNA, we still have that there. I'll say 4i in range. Um, this is how you do it. You have to go through, well, maybe this isn't the best way of doing this. I'll, I'll, I'll take you through this in a second here. Oops, you know what? Okay, so what this is doing now is that we're saying this is a for loop for i in the number that comes from getting the length of DNA. Let me just show you length of my DNA. Any len? This says I've counted my DNA, and I find out that it's actually twelve characters. So now going back to this code here, this is saying for i in range, and then this when you run this thing through, it says this is twelve. That's, a tw that's number 12. So this is for i in range 12. So that means that you're really kind of like counting from 0 to 12 in this statement right here. Now, if, this, if you're looking at this and it, and it means absolutely nothing to you, well, don't worry because this is the same loop or the same uh, for statement every single time you do this. So, I mean, the first time you, you see this, when the first time I saw this, it meant nothing to me. But when I realized that the same thing each time I see the language, then it's, uh, it, it began to make sense. You do not need to know Python in this language because we'll go through everything piece by piece. I know this is not a requisite for the course, but uh, this, stay with me here and we will find our way through this. Um, hopefully this uh, makes sense soon though. So now what we're doing now is we have i becomes my index for index in this number. So basically count from zero to, count from zero to 12 and each count is saved in this variable called i. 
i becomes zero, then it goes to be one, then two, then three, then four, all the way up to the length of this, of this string, which is my DNA. And then what it's doing over here is it says, go through each position of my DNA and print up that character. So when i is, first of all, well, let me just show you something here. I'll just put, um, uh, hang on, index. Index is i. There we go. So the, first of all, the index is going to be zero, then it's going to be one, then it's going to be two, then three, then four, and five. And so this is saying that at, the, at this position in that text, you have at the first or the zeroth position, you have an A, at the first position, you have T, at the second position, you have G, and so on and so forth. And so you have all this, this ability now to work with, with strings in a very simplistic way. Um, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying everybody through, but please do try some of these things here. One of the things that we're going to be doing um, in, uh, in, in, in our lab today is working through, if I can just take you back to the, here, this is our slides, we're gonna be working with actually this particular function, find. So let me just show you this, come back to my uh, thing here. What else do we have in memory here? We have, um, let me just see what else, what was I working with here? My string, my DNA, um, my string. Okay, this is my variable as a string. So if I type in my string like this, and I type in find, I can see whether the word string exists in there. It doesn't, because I misspelled it. But if I spell it correctly, then it should. And what this is saying is that at, at, um, at position number five, or 25 rather, I find that, my, that uh, the, uh, the word string appears. So this right here, this S, is position 25. And I can, I, can, I can prove that to myself by saying, okay, my string, uh, 24, 25, 26, 27. You can see that the word now is actually occurring. So getting back to our slides over here, um, we're actually able to use this find command to actually peer inside a string um, of text and see whether a type of, um, of, of sequence of, of letters or bases appear. So for instance, here, I'm just looking for one particular character, M. Type in your name, and this now becomes the name Mark. Length of name, or sorry, um, the, enter your name. This, uh, this over here, this, this is a, um, an input statement here, but I'm just basically saying whatever the user types in, save it to this, this, uh, this, this integer there. And here we have, hello, Mark. Now I can go through and look into that integer or into that string and see whether M exists or A exists or R or K exists. But the thing is though that you have to be careful that, um, I'll just quickly do this, I know that we're out of time, but we'll hit this when we go back to lab. Um, but if I go ahead and put this in here, enter my name. If I enter my name into this thing here, I have to change these, my quotes here. Uh, I'll call it uh, OBC. And so if I go ahead and say print R -E -S -P, you know, response string, str, you can see the OBC is there. And so now I can go ahead and say is um, R E S P S T R, I can say find, the, the, is, is O in there? And it says that O is at the zeroth position, B is at the first position, and C is at the next position. Now, if I'm looking for, like, for instance, X, X is not in there, and so you can see that it's not there by giving this minus one. So there is that. And so you can, getting back to our slides over here, you're, I'm really doing this same thing. But one thing I will tell you, though, is in, in this case, you'll find that the, um, if you type in mark with an M-A-R-K, all uppercase, then you'll be able to find it. But if I type in a lowercase M-A-R-K, then I won't find it. Let me just show you before we break. If I say look for uh, lowercase b, uh, you'll see that b is lowercase b is not in there because the actual type is uppercase. So that's something to think about. I think that we're done for now. Um, when we come back next time, I'm going to actually, well, in, in lab here, I have a few more things to say about Python and then we'll, we'll basically be done. But you can look through if you want this short program, which actually exists already in your class docs. Um, and you can go through and kind of get an idea about seemingly everything that you've just typed in. Now, one thing I will say is that uh, please do spend some time to kind of like, you know, hack these programs. I mean, try and break them. Copy them into a new name if you want, but try and break them. I mean, see how they work. 
And if the worst thing happens and, and your, your program crashes and you somehow bring down class docs and everything is gone and, doesn't, and nothing works, um, it's no big thing because you can just reclone class docs and you've got everything right back. But what this is going to do, though, it just, is, it just says, uh, please enter your name. It accepts an input. It, it accepts you, um, asks you, you, can, you can actually type in your name. It says it, it prints back to you, your name is such and such. And now it prints to you the length of your name. How long is the, the name that you, or how long is the string that you typed in? And then it goes through and iterates through the characters of the string. It does, in fact, everything you've just done just now. Um, but this is now a program that puts everything together. Um, anyway, we'll when we come to lab. But anyway, if this is the first time you've ever seen Python, um, please don't worry. It gets easier. <laughs> it, gets, it gets more fun, too.